Hello everyone, Derek Floyd here, Beautiful Now Podcast. Welcome to another segment of Chasing the Impossible. Today I have an extremely inspiring story from a gentleman who has walked through so much fire in his life, from divorce to loss of jobs to heart issues to so many things that took him to a dark place. His journey was really, really tough, but he decided, I'm going to do something outrageous through all these things, and he was the actual guy right now who drove his motorcycle from Jacksonville to San Diego and set a record of the fastest time doing it. And he's wrote a book about his journey called No Limits, No Regrets. But before I give my guest the floor, I want to make sure you guys know how to do this right. You know what we got to do. If you enjoy the content you see here, please hit us with a like or a subscribe to the channel. And you want to hit the little bell on the right side to subscribe. This lets me get the most updated content to you as soon as it's available. If you don't hit the bell, you don't get the content. Make sure. And as always, all of our segments are brought to you by IK Multimedia and Shure Microphones, the SM7B. Now, as I said before, this content is going to be great for you. If you have someone that's been through a lot and says, eh, they want to make excuses, I can't go here, I can't do this, I can't live my life well, it's too hard, it's too hard. This guy's life, when you hear what he's been through, there'll be no more excuses. If he can go through what he's gone through and then ride his bike across the country and set a record for it, then we can make it through our daily life. Will you please help me welcome my new friend, Mr. Axe. Hey, Axe, are you out there for me, brother? I sure am. How you doing, sir? Man, how are you, brother? Good to see you. You too. Pleasure to be here. Oh, man, I've been looking forward to chatting with you, man. Your story just blows my mind. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to sharing it, too. You know, I feel like guys like you and me that say no limits, no regrets, those are the kind of guys I want to hang out with, man. We don't take any prisoners, <laughs> right? <laughs> a little bit intense, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, we live the life to the full, right? That's the whole point of it. Get the most and, out of it, right? And that's why we're telling this story. So I'm going to jump right into it, man. And can I just dive into a couple of things that I know? We really introduce how your story came about and, and uh, what you can share with people that will inspire them to do the same thing that you've done, you know, because you've done a lot. Um, sure. You know, you've lived an incredible life now, to say the least. Uh, what made you decide to share your story of No Limits, No Regrets, the way you're sharing it now? Uh, I think it all started with the sharing when I was uh, 34 and I ended up having to have uh, open heart surgery. And like the week before needing to have that surgery, I came on this realization like you could be dead in a week. And it's, it's eye-opening, especially at a young age, right? And so I went through the whole process of taking these notes through the surgery and the recovery afterward. And as I uh, created them, I, I did it for myself to learn about the whole process and try to make sense of it, right? And um, a year later, I looked at these notes and I thought, wow, I have learned so much about life and what to appreciate and how to prioritize and what's important. And I thought, if I can learn that much from this, why couldn't somebody else? And so that's when I did the first book, BOG, and um, started doing some public speaking and some interviews on, you know, self-help type shows and that to try to I'm share. Sorry, what, was, what was the name of the first book? I apologize. I didn't, oh, I didn't catch that. Bouncing off guardrails. Okay. Bounce. Because you said BOG so quickly. I don't know. They, all yeah. the subscribers don't know yet. So, you know, please be clear. Bouncing off guardrails. And that, and that book was about what now? That was about the whole, I started writing it the week before open heart surgery, and I took notes through the, the surgery, the 17 days in the hospital or whatever it was, and the recovery a year later, and just all the things I learned for myself that I thought, why not share that with other people? Maybe somebody else can learn from what I've gone through, right? Because it was mm -hmm. so life-changing for me. And... Mm -hmm. Once I got through that, then with No Limits, No Regrets, I wanted to still inspire people, but in a different way. Instead of just thinking about survival, it's about what can you really do and take that next step in life? Like, what if I, you know, show people that, I, you know, I'm just an average Joe. I'm not a super athlete or anything, right, or a rock star. But <laughs> here I'm just a guy that just found something I really wanted to do. I set a goal. I was determined and disciplined. And I accomplished that goal. And, um, you know, I think that's something that people don't always follow through with their dreams. And that's why we fall short. Right. And mm -hmm. so that dedication and then with the music, the book and the movie, it's not only the words of 
here's this example of taking something that you want out of life. But I think that the products themselves sort of speak to me backing up my words because I do that. I didn't just set a goal and plan and accomplish it. But then I put out a book and then I, I wrote and recorded a, a soundtrack and then I put out a full length movie. And so I think not only the words, but the actions themselves of doing these things can be inspirational to people to see like all these great experiences and skills that I've picked up along the way. I just love that. I love that. And, and when I think about you saying, okay, here's my life experience. I, I'm going to write it all down. And then you thought, wow, someone else might be able to glean from this because you learn so much in that space of just walking through what you walk through and realizing, you know, so many people make excuses about their life. They, oh, this is where I ended up. I, I can't believe I ended up here. And, and they look around, and they just blame everybody else. But we both know that doesn't work. And <laughs> you've got to own where your life is. Uh, you know, and to know what you've done and how you did it always just surprises me. So um, what do you think, though, after all the things you wrote down, everything you walked through, everything that life threw at you, because it was quite a bit, and we're going to get into more of it as we go. What do you think is the, is the main missing, missing ingredient for people that want to live a full life? What do you think? Yeah, you brought up a good one with the excuses, right? Like that's what people tend to do a lot. And they, one of the most common ones I hear is they blame the past, right? Well, I was treated this way by somebody when I was 16 or my dad did this and so I'm going to do it too or, or whatever. And I learned early on that you can learn something from anybody, whether it's a good example or a bad example. You meet everybody and you observe their behavior and you say either this is how I want to be viewed or it's not. And based on that, you then decide, do I want to mimic that behavior or do I want to take my own path and resist it? And so in, in looking at those things, I think a lot of people have the victim mentality nowadays, which is unfortunate. And you kind of touched on it too, right? It's easier to blame somebody else, blame my situation, instead of taking accountability and saying, this is my life, you know, I'm going to do what I want. And where we are in life to me has always been two factors. First one is luck. Now you can call it opportunity or, you know, whatever, what you're given. Right. But the more important one to me is action. It's luck and action. So it's not just where you started in life, but what you do with that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know people that were born with nothing that took over the world. And there's other people that were born with the silver spoons that were lazy and they took it for granted and they did nothing with it. And so I think just looking at those things and you know, the missing ingredient, like I have up here, you know, I wrote desires of, or sorry, success is a function of desire because to me, desire is the one thing it takes to succeed. And it's the one thing most often missing. And, you know, using my own example, that desire of wanting it bad enough to go, you know, become the best in the world at what I love to do. And you hear people say, I want to change. I want to quit drinking. I want to eat better. I want to get up and work out in the morning. But a lot of it is just lip service, right? They don't really want to get out of bed at 5 a.m. to go to the pool. They don't really want to <laughs> put down the Twinkies, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> they say they want it. And if they truly believed it, they could. But you can't make somebody do something they don't want to do. And unfortunately, a lot of times it takes an extreme situation to make them really want it. You take myself, 34 years old, boom, I'm in the hospital because I didn't take care of myself. And believe me, after that, I really wanted to be healthy. I really wanted to take care of myself because that was my warning shot. And not everybody gets those. Um, that brings up a good point because you said you were in the hospital and bam, the moment happened. You said, I can't live like this anymore. And, you know, my question to you was kind of in the same vein of, you know, were you always a no-nonsense, fearless kind of guy? Or did that happen that moment in the hospital? Was that the moment where you changed and said, no more, man. No more excuses. I'm going to live this life to the full. You know, I definitely did change in that situation. But I think, you know, if I think back to being younger, um, I was always kind of a cut to the point kind of person. I didn't waste a lot of time with lies and sugarcoating. But, um, you know, I had the intelligence to observe around me, which is great. But I was the proverbial 98 pound freshman starting high school. And <laughs> being small and, and weak and everything, it just it doesn't build confidence, right? So I was very cautious. I didn't want to take a lot of risk, you know, and our, my, my parents tried to tell us to be careful, you know, always and stuff. And um, so I didn't take a lot of risk, but throughout high school, I lifted weights and I graduated with 75 pounds of muscle I didn't have as, as a freshman. And 
So by Look doing at you, that, got all buffed up, huh? I did, yeah. And <laughs> it was great because by doing that, you, you created something and what you recreated is yourself, right? I, I showed myself that I could become what I wanted. And with that comes such a huge confidence. And, um, you know, at 15, I got a moped for the paper out. And once I got that wind in my face and a little bit of freedom, you know, next thing I'm flying over the hood of a car at full speed and rocketed me across the street. Yeah. And it's, it was scary, but then afterwards I'm like, well, I didn't break anything. I guess I'm okay. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, so then you get bold about it, right? Because it's like, well, now I can do this. Now I can do that. And and I was kind of afraid to work on my first Harley. But dad said, just buy the manual and go figure it out. <laughs> and I started learning that with enough time and money, I can fix anything. There's nothing here that's going to be permanent damage. I can do it. So there's confidence in, in my abilities there. And then I just kept surviving things. I've been through you know, I bounced off airbags twice, totaling cars. I've been through numerous motorcycle wrecks. I've had, you know, heart surgeries. I almost drowned and froze in some river in Illinois. (laughs) And through brains, brawn, or luck, I've always survived. I've always come out of this stuff. And it's not always good, right? Because it's, (laughs) even take last fall, I center punched a deer on a motorcycle in the dark (sighs) at high speed. I killed the deer. I went flying down the highway I ruined all the gear and totaled the bike. And it's a fatal wreck 99 times out of 100 that I walked away from sore and bruised. And wow. the wisdom in me says, you got to be more careful, dummy. That's not smart. But there's that <laughs> other shoulder where the little demon says, see, you're immortal. You can't be touched. <laughs> and, and so it's a great way to live. Um, it does have its downsides in the long term, but Um, But to your point, going through the surgery, there was things I started doing I hadn't before. My buddy was going on a motorcycle ride up to North Carolina. And I said, yeah, I'm in. And he was surprised because I never always said no before. But you learn to like go, you know, for a vacation with my girlfriend, go for a vacation with my buddy. And I crashed up in the mountains 40 minutes after getting there. But I survived it. It was fun. You know, still here (laughs) to tell about it. So it's just this repeated getting away with stuff that sort of makes you even more fearless as you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, I mean, you continue to share more stuff of your story. I'm thinking, how are you still walking around this planet? You, yeah, your story is on purpose, perfect. man, because anybody that says, oh, I can't do it. I, I've been through this. I've been through that. They can't hear your story and go, I got an excuse anymore because exactly. you keep doing it. Uh, you know, blows my mind. So on top of that, though, you walk through some dark spaces early on where – you had divorce, yeah. you lost a job, um, you know, you actually were you somewhat living in poverty for a while. You, you kind of yeah. hit a skid, if you will, if you think about your biking terms. Um, what brought you out of that space? You know, what, what was the one that said, okay, I don't have to be this way anymore. I, w- I want to be better. Yeah, it was, it was a really interesting time of life that um, most people are fortunate enough not to live through, but I consider myself fortunate to have survived it, to be honest. Um, as I mentioned, I had the tendency to put myself in bad situations and somehow get out. Right. So what that means is I had a tendency to just jump in with both feet without really thinking through things a lot. And that's what really got me in the situation I was right. I had a boss and a wife that weren't compatible to be nice, um, with my life. And, um, what really happened in that case, you know, I mean, I've made some bad decisions. There's no two ways about it. And, but in that case, the problem really with those two, it, it was from bad behavior, but on their part, not mine. Mine was in trusting them, right? But mm. my boss, we'd made this agreement. And once, once it came to go time, uh, he said, you're out. And I lost my job. And wow. the, pa- the last paycheck came on a Friday. Two days later on a Sunday, my wife said, I want a divorce. Now, this is after I'd been supporting her for all this time, paying her bills. And then we get into this situation where we'd agreed she would, you know, support me with insurance and everything while I did the shop. And, you know, she's like, paychecks ran out, you're out. And um, so within a week's time, I went from having a good job, the apartment paid for, the, the, you know, food paid for and all this, a rental car and everything, married to living in this really bad neighborhood because... I'd been renting a shop in this bad area and I had no car or job for two years after that. 
So I had to live where I was close enough to walk to the shop. It was my only way to make any money. And, um, you know, I got by on a pack of oatmeal in the morning, a 99 cent ravioli at lunch, maybe a cup of soup and then too much booze. And that was my life. I literally slept with a Glock on the pillow next to me, um, you know, carried it everywhere. And you just learned how to survive because that's what you had to do. And mm -hmm. it's unfortunate because my, my poor choices in some ways that led to that, it was really me trusting those two people, right? I grew up in the Midwest in Iowa where you trust everybody, everybody's good. And everybody's not always good, unfortunately. And, you know, I committed to a boss and a wife because that's what good old Midwesterners do, right? And um, I got burned on both of them. And you have to be careful because it's easy to end up jaded, you know? Mm. And and the answer is not to trust, don't trust anybody. It's be more sensible about it, right? You know, choose mm. better. And there's also a stubbornness to it. You know, I was, I could have moved back home with mom and dad. I could have... Uh, gone back to an engineering job somewhere or, you know, beg my boss for my job back or whatever. But I decided that poverty <laughs> in my shop was the best option, you know. And you bring up something, you know, you walked through a lot of decisions that you made and people were, mm -hmm. they were part, they weren't really, the, they were the cause of where you were going, but you had to make your own decisions to walk which way to go through them. Um, True. And I think when I hear people walking through stuff like that, even as much or as dark as it seemed to be, do you feel like there were a lot of life lessons that you learned that got you to where you are now? Like, would you say that it, you had to go through those things to become the person you are today? I absolutely would. And, um, you know, it's the lessons, as I mentioned, the trusting, right? Like, it's not, the lesson isn't to not trust anybody, it's to be more judicious, more, you know, better judge a character. Um, the one thing that really hit me was a few months after it, it's summer in Jacksonville, Florida. It's just, you know, it's hot, it's humid. And I was in the back of the shop, no AC, sanding on a gas tank for a customer. Um, I was starving. I was hot, sweaty, tired, you name it. And I remember Pantera blasting on the uh, speakers <laughs> and I stopped for a minute and I looked around and I thought, you know what, for the first time in years, I'm happy. And mm. that is a feeling that, you know, is, is, is hard to even capture really, but I didn't have these negative impacts in my life making me miserable anymore. I wasn't trying to run away from anything anymore. And I did what, you know, I, I just had to heal that way. You know, I had to go into this, you know, go to the edge of hell to appreciate, you know, other things. And I, I kind of joke like I shook the etch a sketch of my life, you know, if you remember them toys from a kid, right? Because I had this <laughs> yeah. really mess drawn out after all my years and I shook it and I started drawing a motorcycle because ah. me being in that shop, finding what I loved, like these two wheeled machines that I built these with my hands and this rolling art with, you know, I did the paint, I did the metal and to see somebody ride away making that noise and, and, you know, smiling with something I built with these two hands that's just huge. And um, it really made me reprioritize my life a little bit in in terms of I knew I was on the right path to finding happiness and success, not in financial or career, but in happiness in life, which is so much more important. Right. Oh, I love and that. so I going love that. through that. Yeah, it's just and when I did get back to engineering job eventually and I kept the shop as like a side gig kind of it was. I, I worked hard at it. I appreciated it. I appreciated, you know, the insurance and having a paycheck and my crappy little one bedroom apartment was still nice. Cause I didn't have to feel like I had to sleep with a gun under my pillow and <laughs> the, you know, thousand dollar car I had, it was, uh, you know, it was junk, but it got me around and it wasn't walking anymore. <laughs> and, um, you know, you really just learn to appreciate what you had so much more when you've gotten that close. And, and I think really too, that, the concept that nobody is infallible, like, you know, someone that me, I like, had a great job and married in the suburbs with a nice car and bike. And a year later, I'm living in a crack neighborhood with a gun under the pillow. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's eye opening to see that someone that was most likely to succeed in high school is carrying a gun around because they have to. It's eye opening. So 
I mean, wow. I absolutely wow. agree. Those experiences were so critical to my development at that time. And you, and you mentioned, I love the analogy of the etch and sketch. I've never heard that before, but I'm going to use it. I'm stealing it right now. Um, you can. <laughs> life has been a mess, and you've sketched it out on this etch and sketch. So you shook it all and changed it yeah. all and redrew your life on the etch and sketch. I, I love that. So um, yeah. thinking about all the things you went through and the lessons that you learned and knowing you could have been in a, in a much deeper, darker place because you went from one side of the spectrum to the other. And I feel like you learned about the art of contentment. You learned about what happiness really means. It's, you know, it's not, it's not a destination, you know. It's a state of mind, and you choose to be yeah. happy. And you can put yourself in spaces where you're not and allow people and circumstances to dictate how you feel, or you can pull back and shake the edge and sketch and try it again. So yeah. I love that. I love the way you, you put that together. Um, Great. In the middle of all that, you had a ton of health scares. Like you're, you you yeah. had heart attacks and it, oh my God, tell me what your health path is and how are you feeling today? Yeah, so in junior high, I was diagnosed with a heart murmur. We had to go into like a, a physical, you know, for that age or whatever it was. And they said, you have a heart murmur, which is just a leaky heart valve. And it shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, my grandfather actually lived until 90 plus years old and before he passed away and it was never a problem for him, but I am a little bit more destructive. So at age 29, <laughs> imagine that a little bit, <laughs> yeah, I know. He's, he's <laughs> <up yet. laughs> but uh, at age 29, I was on a 10 day bender and it was a work trip, but I was out with sales folks. We're going out with customers every night, um, 10 days across, I think three States. And I don't remember how many cities, and uh, a lot of travel, a lot of, a lot of partying. And I just woke up one day and felt like I couldn't breathe hardly and went in. And it turned out I had abused my system so bad that I ended up with pericarditis, which is a infection in the lining of the heart. And what? yeah. And so I, uh, I had to stay overnight in the hospital. And the next day they wanted to keep me for observations. And I colorfully told them there was no way and I started ripping electrodes off me. I'm like, I'm out of here. And I just never really felt like I came back well after that. And so then fast forward to age 34. At age 34, I'd spent the last two to three years averaging about two to three hours of sleep a night. And that's not an exaggeration. Uh, it was my pattern is I basically got up about four. I'd go to the day job. I'd get down at five, eat a Totino's 99 cent pizza, go to the shop, work on bikes till nine or whatever, clean up, and then go to the bar with my buddies until, you know, 132 in the morning and then repeat. And that's just rinse, what I did. Rinse, for, repeat, huh? Yeah, pretty much. And <laughs> I mean, there's days where on a Sunday I would sit on the couch sitting there and I would fall asleep for five hours and feel like I'd been in a coma because I was so sleep deprived. Wow. Um, but... I was super productive. I was happy because I was, you know, doing a full time day job. I was getting the bikes done. I was going out and having fun with my buddies. But, you know, there's only so long you can burn the candle at both ends and put a flamethrower in the middle before it melts. And <laughs> I completely so at understand. <laughs> so in 34, <laughs> I realized that something was not right. And I was recommended to go get checked. And I did. And uh, they said that the valve was trashed. And I had to go in for surgery. They tried to repair the valve. Five days later, that gave in. And then I had to have a valve replacement. So right now I have a fake valve that's part plastic and part cow tissue. And um, it was only supposed to last around 10 years, you know, five to 15, they said. And so through that is when I, I really learned all these lessons about having to make the most out of life and appreciate everything and be smarter about my health habits and everything. And so I've made it, you know, over 11, well, it was 11 years uh, since the surgery. And about a year ago, I realized something didn't feel right. And I went and got checked and they found an eight millimeter hole through the middle of my heart, which is you know, like a 516th bolt Good and a you know, fist size organ, right? That's a lot of blood. And so I've got a leaky old valve. I've got this hole through the middle. I've got a bad rhythm now because it's all confused. It's already enlarged. It's got, you know, it's, it's a mess. And 
So they look it over and, you know, this year basically I ended up with four heart procedures total, a couple of cardioversions, uh, hole repair. They did an ablation then. I went in for another double ablation later. And now I'm back in good ejection fraction, which is good. Um, I've also had a second hernia replacement. So now I've got screen doors on both sides of my abdomen. Oh my God. So wow. Then um, in December, what I did is I drove out to Florida for stem cell treatment. It's, you know, new technology and it's something that I've, I've, you know, been researching a little bit and stuff. And I went out there and I got stem cell treatments for my heart and for my joints, my two shoulders and knees. And so I, you know, it's a buddy of mine I've known for 15 years, but I basically left San Antonio, drove to Port Orange or Daytona Beach, Florida, spent a day in the treatment, and then another drive back all in 53 hours from start to finish. And uh, so I still got some of the speed demon left in me for sure. But um, <laughs> You need so, to stay off the bike, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> All those issues with what you're that. doing. <laughs> I'm I'm challenging you. <laughs> you need to be careful with that bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all good fun, but uh, it's <laughs> so right now. I guess you know the way I look at it is 2020 was rough, but it was a rebuilding year, and now I'm I'm as healthy as I can be. I've done all the repairs. I'm in normal heart rhythm and everything, and so um, you know I'm doing a full keto diet. I had like one drink all last year. I'm sleeping well you know, just trying to have a good attitude and everything. And so there's no excuse for me not to be in as good a shape and health as I can. So I'm uh, kickboxing, you know, I was up swimming early this morning, like I said, um, I you know, just doing whatever, uh, because health is everything. If you don't have that, you've got nothing. Well, you mentioned, and we talked about so much has happened, your health, you know, going through the divorce, lost a job, you know, living in a space where you didn't choose. Uh, and and even you lost a loved one. You had uh, someone that you fell in love with and, and lost her to cancer, which is just another, you know, another slot that comes down your life that goes, oh, my God, how much more can this man take? When I heard your story, I thought, was there ever a moment when you thought, I've had enough, I can't do this anymore? And, and what pulled you out of that moment? Yeah, it's um, – I don't think anybody could watch – the life ripped out of the person they love and not come away in a dark place. It's, it's worse than I can describe with words. It's, I never imagined how much, like I'd been with her for six and a half years and just such an amazing person. And to sit there and watch that happen to her, to somebody good. Right. And to go through that, I always just thought people are expendable. You know, we fall off the face of the earth, people die and the world still turns. It's just the way life goes. But I never estimated just how much that would destroy me. And so afterwards, I, I needed a way to try to get my head straight, right? Like, how do you process something like this? It's so much easier to think about your own death, mm -hmm. but somebody else's, that's tough. Yeah, and sure. uh, so, Every day was an experiment. I, you know, would listen to different kinds of music. I would listen to different, watch different movies, hobbies. And it's just every day is an experiment. What worked, what didn't work, and you you adjust and move on. And, you know, it was around the holiday time. So I was able to not have to deal with humans, just me and the dog <laughs> at home. And what I ended up doing is I ended up shutting all the lights off in the house for weeks and just uh, really dark, angry metal music playing. And I sat and wrote every awful thing that's happened in my life since pre two years old age. And, and there's a lot of it. And it's just- Oh my God. I almost can't... like needing to knock myself and find the bottom, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I found the bottom and the end of that was leaving her funeral, come ripping down a mountain in the snow, not really caring what happens. And it's a dark place to be in, uh, believe me. Then I started looking at all the positives of my life in the same exercise, but reversed and trying to build on, you know, now I've, I've leveled myself. This is the bottom of where you're at. Now, how do you start building back up? Same way I had to do in, you know, with the bike shop, build back up from really nothing. And I didn't go near alcohol, bikes, fast cars for 
hell, I don't know, months, six, eight months, whatever, because I knew that I'm a destructive person anyway, to some extent. And it's one thing to do it with a smile, having fun at it. It's a different thing to be in that dark mental state doing it where it's just apathy. And so yeah. I really had to watch myself and slowly ease back into it. And ultimately, you know, where you come out of it is, you know, it's been seven years and it's still tough and it still tortures you. But what you realize is you need to make all you can really do is honor that person's memory by being the best person you can and enjoying mm -hmm. life the best you can. And so I don't talk about the darkness that much because that's for me to deal with, not you or someone else. But sure, for a situation sure. like this, where me sharing that maybe can help some of your viewers or listeners see that someone else has gone through this, benefit from it, get some ideas about what works and what doesn't, then if I can use that darkness to help somebody else, it, it almost justifies it or gives it a purpose. And, you know, I think that's where I finally had to come to peace with is, you know, even like the movie, I mean, it shows, you know, a time of our lives together and I'm able to honor her memory in that period by doing that. I love that you took the time, someone would say therapeutic, to write out all the anger and the frustration and the darkness, to kind of expunge it, if you will. You took a moment and you said, okay, everything out of me is dark. I'm just going to pour it all out on this paper. And then once it was all out and you expunged it all, you took the reverse method and said, now let's talk about what's positive. Let's re-engage with life now, now that I've expunged all that. And I'm sure it gave you a new resurgence, a new appetite for life after all that. And I'm sure it was difficult to walk the steps, but you did it. And again, this is one of those those things that people out there maybe need to hear. Sometimes you're in a dark place, people, guys. Sometimes it just feels like you're, you're sinking, you're drowning. But if you can expunge all that out, if you can write it out, do what you do, however you want to do that to get those dark places out of you and then reverse that and be thankful, be grateful, walk in gratitude, right. it changes your whole perspective, that's for sure. Uh, and, really and I sit here and go, with all that that you did, and we've talked about a lot, right? I'm still out of breath just thinking about everything you did, uh, where the heck did the motorcycle cross-country thing idea come up? Because you love motorcycles, obviously, but what made yeah. you go, I'm going to drive across the country and break a record? Where did that come from? Well, you know, like a lot of kids, I grew up watching Dukes of Hazard and Cannonball Run and Smokey and the Bandit and all this. And Smokey and the Bandit. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Around, I mean, man. all the classics, right? <laughs> and <laughs> and you know, like Rock Yates and, and Burt Reynolds and stuff that were, you know, racers. And they, they, you know, every it was a giant middle finger at the 55 mile an hour speed limit in the late 70s and everything. And, you know, that's just as I was a child starting to grow up. But then... You know, about the time, uh, you know, years ago before the ride, I got a hold of a book and movie about Alex Roy breaking the cross country New York to L.A. Um, car record. Right. And watching that and, and reading about it, I, I found myself not even able to finish the story hardly because I was starting to get so excited about the idea of somebody doing this in real life and better yet. You know, I'm, I'm big on if you're going to enjoy life, be a participant, not a spectator, right? Like, I don't sit around and watch people live life. I want to do my own stuff. And oh, yeah. so oh, yeah. seeing all that and reading about it, and I'm like, well, I can't compete with him in a car. I don't have a spotter plane and a team of three people to take with me and all this. <laughs> but I'm a two-wheel guy, and who else is dumb enough to try this on a motorcycle, right? Like, that's insane. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do. And so I started planning, and it took me – probably nine months or so, I guess, um, you know, to get through it, uh, the planning part of it. And then when I went out to San Diego, I shipped the bike there and all my parts to assemble. And I found out that the co-owner of that dealership, Gary, he was the guy that had the, the record before me that I, I couldn't find in a web search. No and uh, yeah, so he what was telling eyes? me... It was, and it was great because, you know, here I was able to shake the hand of the guy whose record I'm about to beat, right? I didn't know it at the time, but, but um, you know, it's because like how many people are crazy enough to try something like that? So it was really <laughs> kind of an honor to uh, talk to him about his experience before I went and did it. And, um, you know, it's, 
it's just like it, it, it's a chance like how many people get to be the best in the world at something and at what they love like i love to ride my motorcycle fast right and and it's like an addiction you know you're 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 doing these little little runs through the hill country or these little race events or something and then this is like that mother load of of just adrenaline hitting your system and something <laughs> so intense that it helps you kind of get your fix so you can go back to just enjoying your daily life <laughs> and your daily life has never been simple <laughs> it's always <laughs> been a little bit out of the ordinary so i, I can't even bit, imagine yeah. you living a regular daily life Doesn't, i can't even imagine that uh and and to, to clarify you broke the record that that you rode your motorcycle from was it from jack san diego to jacksonville beach yeah san diego to jacksonville yep so you are you still the record holder for that ride as far as I know, I haven't had anybody tell me they beat me yet. I had one <laughs> okay. guy reach out to me a year or two later. He reached out and he's kind of like, hey, I ran across to you researching. I'm thinking about doing this. And so we chatted back and forth a while. And a few days later, he, he wrote back and he goes, yeah, there's no way I can touch that. There's just no way. You know? and, and it's, um, yeah. So, it so was, you, and that was the, and that was the fastest ride so far. So thinking about that, what was the most memorable moment of that ride for you the most memorable was probably because it was so intense with both fear and excitement and i don't i don't really believe you can have one without the other right like they kind of go hand in hand but i was going through western florida so by this point you got to imagine i've been on the road for close to 30 hours i've had no sleep um i've had two slim gyms and a couple liters of red bull and gatorade mixed for my camelback <laughs> And so, That's so uh, not good for you. <laughs> I know, you know. How did I end up with bad health? Who knows, right? And, <laughs> so I'm ripping across this open, you know, if you've ever made that I-10 uh, drive across Western Florida, it's just a straight road through trees. And at some point I can remember being next to this pickup truck and we're both doing high speeds. And um, I remember having this thought of, oh, I wonder if, this guy's going to be on my team in the next round of this race, or if I'll have someone else on my team. And in my brain, I'm picturing this circular or oval track through the trees, you know, like a, like an overhead view. And, and then I kind of got freaked out because I'm like, whoa, I'm at the point where I, I'm, I'm having a dream at the same time I'm in reality. Oh. And it's a little bit a goofy of a, an experience, but I've felt it before when you get in that 25, 30 hours of no sleep. Mm -hmm. And you get so sleep deprived that you have a dream as you're in reality. And so I got really kind of freaked out because I'm like, now yeah. how do I, yeah, how do I, how do I, <laughs> yeah. I straight these out? Right. And so I had to think, and you're and I'm still like, on wait the a bike, minute, right? Oh yeah. On the I'm, bike I'm doing over a mile an hour on a motorcycle at this time oh, in the dark. Gosh. And it, it oh, doesn't help that the motorcycle has, you know, a thermal vision screen on the tank. It's got a big dash on it. And it's literally like I'm in a video game anyway, right? I've got the radar oh, detector going. Gosh. And so it just creates this imagery of being in a, a dream of a video game. And I, I had to remind myself, I'm like, dummy, you're on I-10 East. You got to go <laughs> to the beach. And, and I had to kind of talk myself down and say, I know you're having a dream and you're freaked out. It's okay because... You, you got a system that works. You've made it this far. You're going to be fine. Just keep pointing the bike straight. Don't get turned around. Just keep going straight and it'll be okay. And eventually the dream state kind of settled out and, and the, the logic part could take back over again. Um, but it, it was kind of intense for a while there to kind of sit this. It's not just mind over matter. It's mind over mind and it's both your minds, right? <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's so, that's scary. I mean, you, you are is. such a daredevil, bro. I I I could never live as crazy as you've lived, and I live pretty good, pretty full life. But you're way beyond what I would ever even consider going through. So you made it. You set a record. You've been through all these things in your life, which is why you're here to tell your story, to tell people no limits, no regrets, live your life to the full, and you've shared that story. So when you look at all the things you've done the good, the bad, the ugly, everything you've accomplished. What's next for you? What, what's, what's on the horizon for X now? What's the next space you're going to move into? 
Well, 2020, to say the least, was rough, right? Um, you know, I mean, and I, I'm grateful I was able to keep my job through it. And with all the health stuff, I came out of it. I mean, a lot of people had a worse year than I did. But, you know, just from the fun standpoint, didn't get to do a lot of the things I usually do in a year, you know, from motorcycle and fun things and that. Um, got a couple little short trips and stuff. But um, so this year, you know, I'm looking forward to getting the vaccine and being able to go out in the world a little bit more and do more things. Uh, you know, I want to get ready to do another Texas mile, which is a one mile kind of drag race, basically. And, um, you know, with the bike, uh, I'd like to go do um, things like, uh, you know, another Colorado trip. I'm used to going out there every fall in either a car or bike and rip through the mountains. And, you know, there's nothing more intense than ripping around at 11,000 feet where there's no guardrail. It's just a drop down and uh, you're, you know, getting close to that white line just to just attempt fate, right? Um, it's pretty you scare intense. Me, so Alex. you scare me. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> you scare me. Um, it's so intense, dude. It's like you're just risking that one way skydive. But well, all those kind of things. what's that? Go ahead. Go ahead. And um, you know, take another super bike class. I've done those before. They're a lot of fun. Um, maybe go to Atlanta and take the Porsche racing class and visit the museum up there. And um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm working on a third book that kind of covers more the, the topic of loss and, and better perspective on life and maybe write something that's not so much of the fun, exciting, but more of the actual helpful type uh, literature people could benefit from. And then, um, you know, promoting let me, the let movies. Me pause you before you, let me pause you before you sure. finish because I want the subscribers to hear which books are available. I'll start from the beginning. The first book was called? Bouncing Off Guardrails is the first one. And that was and the one about going through heart surgery and uh, recovery and everything. And, and then, then the No Limits, is... No Regrets. No, yeah, second book is No Limits, No Regrets. And, um, and then, of course, the soundtrack for the album that I did and then the movie now. And, and where are all third... these things available? Where can they find you? Oh, uh, Amazon. Everything is available on Amazon. You can get, like, the music's available on Amazon. Uh, the movie's available on Amazon. I have CDs and discs, Blu-rays and that for people that prefer those that they can go to uh, ychrome.com and uh, and find them there as well. But, you know, Amazon has just become the giant. If you want to sell stuff, you've got to go through them. <laughs> yeah, it's like. so true. So true. So yeah. true. Yeah. So that's all well, those. I am... and then... Go ahead. I was go just going to say, and then, and then, you know, in promoting the movie is just, you know, because it's your art, right? Like it's something that's very personal to me because – in the seven, eight month period, uh, you know, that year the movie covers, I had the most triumphant and most tragic moments of my life in that period. So mm. this is something very personal and, and very much a share to me in that respect. And so being your art, you know, it's no good if nobody knows about it. So you want to share that. <laughs> it's, so true. Others, it's so true. You know, experience what I have, right? Wow. Wow. Well, I am just so pleased that you took the time to talk to us today. And I hope that everyone that's listening out there that took the time to watch the episode found themselves in the story when they were either too dark to talk or felt like they had a loss or walked through health issues and all those things that we encounter in life feeling like I can't make it through. This young man has walked through all of those things and then rode his bike across the country and set a record. Yep. If, if he can do all those things, ladies and gentlemen, then we yep. can too. So thank you so much, Axe, for taking the time. We really do appreciate you, brother. You bet. Thanks so much. It was great talking to you. Take care. And to all the subscribers out there, once again, I appreciate you taking the time to watch these episodes. We want to make sure you stay uplifted, encouraged, and inspired. So if you love the content you see here, share it with someone. Let someone else be uplifted today. We want to keep you thinking that you can make it too. You're impossible. Whatever it is, is worth chasing. Have a great one, guys. Take care, and we'll see you next time at the Beautiful Now podcast, Chasing the Impossible. Take care.